Hello! Welcome to Teach Me Maths. My name is Jonathan Hicks and we're doing T-tests. In particular, this is the paired T-test video. So if you want to know the difference between the different kinds of T-tests you can do, go and watch the T-test overview video where I talk about the differences. In this video, I'm going to do an example of how you do a paired T-test in practice. Now, for my example, I've uh, decided to use a set of patients. So we're going to have 20 patients all together who've been given a wonder drug that will supposedly improve their IQ. So we've given these 20 patients an IQ test and recorded the results. And then we gave them this drug to hopefully improve their IQ. And then we gave them an IQ test again to see if they'd actually got any better. And we recorded the results. Now, I'll show you the results in a minute, but it's important at this point to specify your null hypothesis and your alternative hypothesis. So I'll stick that over here, perhaps. So H0, the null hypothesis, is going to be, well, obviously, you want the drug to improve their IQ. So the null hypothesis is it doesn't improve. There's no change in their IQ. So no change in the IQ of the patients. So H1, the alternative hypothesis, this is what we're hoping to prove, is that there is a change. And not just a change, but we're hoping that there's going to be an improvement in their IQ. So H1 is that there is a, they have better IQ after they've taken our wonder drug. So just bear those in mind. We'll refer back to those later. Now, in terms of the actual data, if I perhaps show you this now. So here's the data. I've just typed it into Excel. So you can see down there, we've got the patient number. We've got 20 different patients. And then there's the test result, their IQ test from before they took the drug and then their IQ, IQ test after they took the drug. And you can see that some of them have definitely improved. Uh, one or two haven't improved very much. In fact, I think patient number 10 has actually got worse. But we're looking to see if there's an overall improvement. If the mean IQ after we gave them the drug has improved significantly from the mean IQ before they took the drug. And this is what we're going to use the test, the t-test to compare, is the mean after the drug with the mean before. But the important thing about paired t-tests, which is what we're doing here, is that you have to calculate your uh, different values, so the mean and the standard deviation things, which we'll be using in a minute, on the differences between each of the results. So if you take patient one, their two IQ results before and after the test, you need to find the differences of those. So for each pair, you subtract one from the other to find the differences. And then when we find the mean and the standard deviation, we're going to be finding the mean of the differences and the standard deviation of the differences. That's very important. It's not the mean and standard deviation of the samples. It's going to be the mean and standard deviation of the differences between the pairs in the samples. So if we have another column on, there are the differences. So I've just taken the second IQ, the IQ after they had the drug, and subtracted the first IQ from before they had the drug, and that gives us our set of differences. So you can see there's a couple of negatives where their people actually got worse, but on the whole, they do seem to be positive numbers. People seem to have improved after they took the drug. But was that just due to chance? Can we actually assume the alternative hypothesis that they're, they had a better IQ? Because, you know, the second time they did the test, they may have just got lucky and happened to get some answers right when really they didn't have a clue. So this is what we're going to look at with the t-test. OK, now let's clear that for a minute while I just explain what the t statistic actually is, what we're going to calculate here. So t, the value we're going to be comparing in our t-table in a moment, is the mean times the square root of n, the number of samples, divided by s, the standard deviation. Now again, it's very important here you realize x bar here is not the mean of the samples, it's the mean difference. So all those differences that we had in that table, x bar is the mean of those differences. s, the standard deviation, again is the standard deviation of the differences. Now I'm not going to go into the details of how you calculate the mean and standard, devi standard deviation. I'm assuming you already know that. But essentially, to work out the t-statistic here, 
you work out the mean of the differences, the standard deviation of the differences, stick the numbers in here, and then out pops your t statistic. So, I've already worked out the calculations here for you based on that data. So, the mean of all the differences, as I say, if you add up all those differences and divide by 20 in this case, because there were 20 patients, then you're going to get 4.2. Now, if you then multiply that by root 20, because there are 20 patients in our sample, and we're going to divide that by the standard deviation. Again, this is the standard deviation of the differences. So that column with all the differences, you're finding the standard deviation of those. And in this case, it turns out to be 7.266. So stick all this in a calculator, and we get 2.2. 5.85. So our t statistic or t value is 2.585. What does that mean? Well, if you remember from the overview video, essentially the larger the t value is, the more confident we can be that there is a real difference, is, real difference between the two means that we're comparing. In this case, the mean IQ before they took the drug and the mean IQ after they took the drug. But to see if this, you know, how big is significant to see how important this is and whether or not this is a, a big enough value of t you have to compare it with a t table now if i shove up the uh, t table over this so you can see it there we'll just quickly look at the t table so in the t table the first thing you've got to notice is the degrees of freedom which is the numbers down the left hand side so the df as it's often called the degrees of freedom is always the number of samples minus one this is for a paired t-test, okay? It's different for other tests. So degrees of freedom is the number of samples minus one. So in this case, obviously the number of samples is 20. So the degrees of freedom is 19. So we're gonna read down the left-hand side of this table until we find 19. Once we've found that, we need to decide how confident we want to be in our results. Now, to cut a long story short, the level at which you can say you reject the null hypothesis and you're happy to accept the alternative hypothesis is the 95% level. Now in some situations you can be more confident, you might want to go to the 99% confidence level, but the 95% is usually considered good enough for most purposes. So that's the one we'll use. So if you look along the top of the table, you're looking for the 0.95 or 0.950, which is that one, and then you can you cross-reference that with the 19 degrees of freedom. Now there's one other thing I should point out here is that you've got the choice between one-tailed or two-tailed tests. Uh, now to illustrate this, uh, let's put the table away for a minute and let me draw you a picture. So if we move this out the way perhaps and I'll stick our T value on the other side. So we discovered T, let's put it here was 2.585. Now we're going to come back to that, it's going to be very important in a minute, but let me just show you what the t distribution is going to look like. So broadly speaking it's like a normal distribution except it's a bit sort of fatter at the sides, something like this, and to be 95% confident that means that we're going to pick a value here such that 95% of the samples are here and 5% is here. Now the critical value for the 95% point is what we can read off from the table. So let's just bring the table back for a moment. So 19 degrees of freedom down the left hand side, 0.95 for 95% confident along the top and you know what I was saying about one tail or two tailed? We're expecting an improvement. Our H1 here is a better IQ. We're only expecting it to improve, not, we're not expecting it to get worse. So it's a one-tail test. So just going back to the picture again for a second, you can see that the, there's a one side that we're interested in. We're not bothered about what happens on the low end. We're assuming that they're going to improve, so this is why it's a one-tail test, because there's a change in one direction only. Back to the table again. So if you read off 0.95 at the top, 19 down the left-hand side, the critical value here is 1.8. Three, three. 
Okay, we'll write that on. 1.833. What that means is, is that if you do, if you compare two means, from two samples, and your T value is 1.833, that means there's a 95% chance that there is a better IQ, that there is an actual difference. And there's a 5% chance that that difference between the mean was due to luck. So the probability of these patients, the 20 patients, getting better scores on their second test with a t-value of 1.833 is only 5%. So what you want to do to make a conclusion here, to either um, reject the null hypothesis and say yes there's a better IQ, or stick with the null hypothesis, to make a conclusion you have to compare your t-value, which was 2.585 that we calculated, with the critical value at the 95% level. Now you can see the t-value we calculated is more than 1.833. So, you know, it might be over here, if we extend this, it might be over here somewhere. 2.585. That means there's less than 5% chance that they could have got this difference between the means by chance. So that's pretty good. That means we're fairly confident that this wonder drug is actually working and that we can accept the better IQ. Now, if we just go back to our 99% for a moment, maybe we could be really confident and say there's a 99% uh, confidence of this drug giving the people a better IQ. Now, if we put the table back up, so same again, 19 degrees of freedom down the left-hand side, one tail test, but along the top, we are going to find the 0.99 level. That's the 99% level here. So if we read down, this time we're going to get 2.821. That's the critical value. So if we go back to our picture, that's going to be bigger than the 2.585. So the 1% level, the 2.821, so that you'd have 1% of the data here, we're not actually that big. Our t-value is not big enough to say that we're 99% confident that there's a better IQ. So when we draw a final conclusion, we would say we can reject the null hypothesis, we believe that this drug does give you a better IQ, and we can say that with a 95% confidence because our t-value was bigger than the 95% t-value from the table. We can't say that we're 99% confident. We would have to have a t-value bigger than 2.821, which we don't. So that's how you draw a conclusion. And in general, as long as your t-value, 2.585, is bigger than the one from the 0.95 level, the 95% level, then you can reject the null hypothesis and accept whatever change you're looking for, whatever improvement in this case in their IQ due to the drug. So hopefully that's given you a handle on how you use the t-test. It's fairly simple to calculate and practice, um, and then you just look it up in the table. It doesn't take too long. As I say, do go and watch the other videos if you want to know about unpaired or independent t-tests and the one-sample t-tests. Um, but that hopefully rounds out this one nicely. My name is Jonathan Hicks, and you're watching Teach Me Maths.